everybody. My name's Cliff. Um, and, you know, I'm going to talk to you really, um, you know, the, the theme, as, um, uh, as has been said, is, you know, the intersection of technology. Thank you so much. The intersection of technology and social. Uh, and so the way that I sort of think about this is, you know, uh, I definitely don't build social networks. I just use them for performance art. Um, so instead, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm going to talk about my experiences building a team, building a company, uh, the things mainly that I got wrong, um, and, you know, the anti-patterns you probably shouldn't do. So, that being said, um, my company is called Boundary, um, and uh, I want to take you back to the very beginning, uh, to, to, to when it got founded. Um, and there's a really good, uh, there's a really good quote from a friend of mine. Um, this is the most amazing thing that I've ever heard come out of his mouth, and he said a lot of really amazing things, is that a systems engineer without a good startup idea will inevitably end up doing monitoring, um, which I just think is, is wonderful and also heartbreaking, because then I realized it applied to me as well. Uh, so yeah, you know, what, uh, so I was, I was at a company called PowerSet uh, for a while. Um, really cool place, it was my first like Silicon Valley startup thing, and you know, since I was in high school, like I wanted to, you know, so I went to high school during the first dot-com boom, uh, you know, back in the 90s when Yahoo was still cool, um, you know, like that's, like, you know, I, I was like, oh my God, I got to go out there and I got to do this. Like that was my, and then the big crash came and, you know, I flunked out of college and blah, blah, blah. And like all that, all that kind of stuff, uh, all that stuff happened and it looked like, oh, the dream is dead. Uh, but then suddenly, you know, Google went public. And the dream became alive for a lot more people. Um, and the story came back, and uh, which was cool, I think. You know, so so what did I end up doing? I ended up, uh, you know, moving my whole family out to uh, out to California, joined a company called PowerSet, and uh, there, you know, I sort of learned, uh, you know, learned the ropes, or the beginning of the learning the ropes for you know doing startups. Um, so we got bought by a company called Microsoft. You might have heard of them, uh, and then you know immediately thereafter, ground into dust. Um, so. You know, Microsoft has this way of digesting the companies that they, they acquire. Uh, kind of sucked, but uh, after I got out of PowerSet, I said, you know, I really want to do a startup, and, and um, really uh, the, um, the, the, the obvious choice seemed to be monitoring um, because of this. The idea really was we wanted to concentrate on the network. Um, the idea there being that, uh, you know, the, the, the theory was, okay, you know, there's, there's, there's no tools. Uh, yeah, this was this was like in the beginning, the early days of EC2. So like, there's no tools uh, that could really look at you know cloud traffic. There's no tools that could actually give you good network data uh, in, a, in a completely software delivered way. Uh, so we thought there is you know an opportunity there. But the problem is you know in that sort of environment, you don't have uh, access to the network hardware. You, honestly, like we had no idea about the, the shape of the data that they produced. Like like in other words, like. We knew they produced a lot of data, but we didn't even know what, you know, like between ne uh, network manufacturers, like we didn't even know uh, there's different specs for each and every each and every switch and each and every router. So, um, you know, we, we didn't have, um, we were basically starting from zero, uh, which is kind of bad. Um, and what we ended up doing was we, we, uh, we adopted a software agent uh, called Magi. It was like this weird little project out of uh, New Zealand and, um, you know, it was uh, an open source project, so we started using that, and yeah. So the, the, the main design goal, I mean, honestly, like our, the, 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 this was as much as we had thought it out. We, we said, okay, we want to produce an API that uh, spits out your network data and looks like Google Analytics. Um, so is, is everyone here used the Google Analytics API? Yeah, okay, yeah. So the Google Analytics API is this, uh, what we, the, the idea was like dimensions and metrics, right? So you know, taking a set of metrics, aggregating them over a different set of dimensions, um, and, and basically being able to, to roll up tremendous amounts of, of, of data by, by categorical, um, you, know, you know, in these like categorical columns. So in other words, you know, being able to make a query like, um, like for instance, you know, if you're getting attacked by China, you might want to, you, know, you might want to be able to, to roll up your network data in such a way that you can, you can see that and you can visualize it, uh, but you need to have this, this ad hoc aggregation ability uh, after the fact. So uh, we went about testing, these, testing this with um, early prototypes. This is the beginning of the NoSQL days when everything was still extremely terrible. Um, so our first iteration was over the O20 release of HBase. Um, 
which um, actually the, and the interesting part is that we, we paid for our servers to actually stand this up by doing consulting work for Basho. Thanks, Justin. Uh, you know, so very much bootstrapping, trying to get things uh, off the ground. Uh, so we built the prototype, and uh, this, this gentleman, who's actually a, a competitor with our, previ our previous presenter, uh, he, he broke it for us. So he, he, this, he was actually, uh, uh, Arthur was great, because he was, the, he was our test bed for these things. So essentially, we would produce the prototype, build it all up, um, and then ask him to put a meter on one of his uh, gigantic you know, CDN cache machines and just spew data at it until it breaks, uh, which is great. And he was very good at breaking things. So you know, uh, he broke it. The, the, um, what, what, ended up happening was, um, what ended up happening was that there was actually a bug in that version of HBase. So HBase would fall right over and uh, it, it would actually, it would forget that it was serving the master, it would forget that it was serving the master region, uh, which is the, you know, the, the lookup table that it uses to tell which server your data is on. So that's kind of a bad thing for it to forget about. Um, <laughs> so back to the drawing board. Um, and we, we really, you know, we said, okay, well, the HBase thing's not working out. Yeah, there's a bug in that version, but, you know, this is a, a, an inflection point, a chance to say, you know, what are we actually trying to build here? Uh, so we started doing some research and, the, the, you know, the thing that came, came upon us is like, oh yeah, you know, that dimensions times metrics thing, like that's actually an OLAP system and there's this big body of research for it, maybe we should read some papers. So we started reading about OLAP data models, you know, it's, it's an n-dimensional hypercube, it's very simple, you know, n-dimensional, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but anyway, like you, you can visualize the entire space uh, as a, um, uh, you know, every, so if you're, if you're having seven dimensions, it's a seven dimensional cube, but we keep it to three dimensions in the diagrams to make your brain not explode. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so you think about any sort of query you can do in this, in this type of model is actually a sub -cube. So if you want to take a slice out of it, uh, this is actually what, what, when data modeling, when uh, analytics people talk about you know, slicing data and pivoting data, they're actually talking about um, literally like, like, the, like the, 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 uh, taking things in an n-dimensional plane and slicing through it. So cool. Um, so we did, we did a bunch of research. We went out um, and uh, you know, talked to people in the field who were, who were doing these, um, you know, who, who were actually researching a lot of the, the OLAP primitives. And we came up with this, uh, we actually stole from a paper this idea of minimal cubing, of minimal cubing index. So we figured we could make uh, you know, these three dimensional subcubes of the n-dimensional space. Um, so it, it limits the amount of index that you have to build. So you don't end up in a situation where you're building more index than the, you know, because if you try to index everything, if you try to index everything as a cross product, you're going to end up with more index than actual primary data, which is bad. Um, so we, we put together this uh, sparse, uh, the, basically these sparse, these sparse tables, um, and we put, it all, we put it all on top of Cassandra. This is kind of what the cuboid table looks like. It's basically like a reverse index. So if you've ever built a search engine or, or like looked inside, the, looked inside the Lucene, it's extremely similar, um, we, and we built it on top of Cassandra. So we hacked this thing together in about a month. Um, you know, I think I locked myself in my home office and uh, didn't see my wife or child for quite some time, and you know, just hacked away at it and, and, and built it all up. Uh, and it actually worked, which was uh, shocking. It's worked with smaller data sets, but our friend Arthur still broke it. Um, <laughs> he's good at it, what, what, what can I say? So the, uh, so the interesting part, though, was that is that we could actually keep up with the ingest rate. So as data was coming in, we actually kept up with the write rate. Turns out Cassandra's really good at writes. Uh, but um, once we, we, we looked at the app server during the query times, because uh, the query times were extremely slow, and we found out that what it was doing is, and, you know, the, uh, you know, if you're using Cassandra through the thrift interface, which is all it had at this point, um, the, uh, as it was fetching indexes, it was actually fetching, fetching like 10 megabyte indexes back and forth uh, several times per query. So that's clearly uh, had some data locality issues. Okay, cool, we'll do that Hadoop trick, right? We'll move the computation to the data. Uh, and this came up, and this allowed us to come up with the idea of um, a project that we called uh, Scylla. So we took all of our logic, all of our business logic and indexing logic, and we uh, basically just shoved it inside of Cassandra. Uh, so we uh, cracked it open. Uh, forked the whole thing, built all new query paths, all new ingest paths, so we bypassed all the thrift stuff, we bypassed everything, uh, and it was essentially dealing just with raw SS tables. 
Um, and so the indexing and query planning code uh, all went in there. And we, we mainly, I mean, we basically built a, uh, a distributed database with uh, just the parts of Cassandra. Uh, and so it actually was a pretty good prototype. Um, you know, it worked. Uh, Arthur stopped breaking it, which was nice. And uh, so on top, on the back of this prototype, we actually got funded. Uh, so it became like a real company. Could hire people to actually build a real product on top of this thing. Uh, so it was cool. Which brings us to the post-funding era. So it turns out when you take money, uh, you have to like build a product that, that goes out and makes money, right? So you know you have to go out there, you have to sell this. Um, so but but the problem is that we're having trouble scaling the system, right? So uh, we were having issues with uh, people, you know, larger and larger customers coming on board. Um, the problem with the problem with Scylla is that it had uh, extremely bad load balancing. So the load balancing was was literally like the top, like. The, the, the hour part of the timestamp along with the customer is a tuple. Uh, there's indexing race conditions, there's a bunch of bad stuff. And the Cassandra, actually the Cassandra data format was not ideal for the, for the type of structures that we're building. We really, uh, we, we looked at it and we were like, okay, we're, we're on kind of a weird path here. Um, and if we keep going down this, this weird path dependence, we're gonna end up just rewriting uh, you know, the, the storage layer of Cassandra, which is a pretty big undertaking. So we kind of took a step back and said, okay, uh, can we solve an easier problem here? Like, what, what are we actually trying to do? Uh, and that's where we came up with the idea of streaming. Right? So instead of trying to do all this on disk and then pull it back out as a query, uh, we, we'll try to compute everything on the fly as it happens. We can store off the, the resulting aggregates. And uh, but the cool thing is that you know, we can use WebSockets. We can push things to the browser immediately so people get that immediate feedback loop of what's going on on their, on their, uh, on their servers. So it's like, cool. Uh, you know, that's actually a vastly better experience than most modern dashboards because no one had tried to do a streaming dashboard yet that we knew of. Um, and so instead of having to explicitly query things and request them, you know, you can have it just stream to the, to the browser. Think, okay, cool. So we built this thing called Streaker. Uh, the first prototype actually used Esper, uh, which is its own nightmare uh, in its own way. But uh, we finally thought we had something that we could scale out and that we could build a real product on. Uh, and that's, that's when we started to build out the team and then build out um, and that's where we come to the social side of things, because as soon as you build out a big team, you, 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 know, you need to build a culture and, and uh, you know, all these things start to really matter. Um, and so the, 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 really the, the, key, the key thing that we, that we learned is that um, the, the key takeaway here is like the team actually, uh, the team and the culture actually build the product, right? And so it doesn't, that sounds kind of like a truism, but like, it, you know, it has some profound uh, effects, which I'll show you. And what do I mean by culture? Because like, you know, startup guys like to talk about this <laughs> word a lot and, you know, can't really define it well. So, I'm, you know, for the, for the purposes of this talk, uh, you know, startup culture, I, I'd say is a shared set of values, right? Like, uh, like how do you make decisions? Um, how, do you, uh, how do you go about your daily, you know, how do you go about your daily work without, uh, without locking, right? Because, you know, I, I think in terms of distributed systems, uh, so culture is actually a distributed consensus problem, right? So you have a team of, of individuals who can only talk through a lossy network of talking to each other. Um, and so a strong, a strong culture is a strong consensus uh, so that you, know, you can all sort of run in parallel uh, without having to check in on everything, right? You know, so uh, you, know, you can think about it two ways. You can say like the eventually consistent system is the one where everyone just goes and does their work and somehow they all come to the same conclusion uh, because, of the, because of the invariance of the system. Versus, you know, a culture with a strong process, which means you know you have to get approval for everything. Uh, that's like you know, three phase, or two phase commit, right? So, um, so for us, uh, you know, we, we what we learned here is that the, the the culture and the technology though they they tend to reinforce each other. Um, and so the, the the choices that you make in building the culture, um, they affect the type of, of choices that you can make in the future, right? And so, uh, in other words. You know, if we had stayed on the Cassandra path, right, and, and had not decided to, to scrap the requirements of that and just scrap the whole thing, uh, we would have been path dependent on having this weird Cassandra code base. And basically, the way it looks is going to be the way it looks. In the, the way it looks today is going to be the way it looks in the future. Like you're not going to change the fundamentals of the system, right? So if it's a if it's a if it's a streaming system, it's always going to stream essentially. If it's a, a query and response type of system, then you're always going to have that dynamic in, in talking to it because th those things are too hard to change. That's what I mean by path dependence. Um, and it turns out that the, there's path dependence in your culture as well. Because uh, this idea of the Overton window. Uh, is anyone familiar with this term? Yeah. 
So the, the Arbiton window is it's from political science, uh, but it's a, this, this idea of there being a spectrum of acceptable choices that you can make uh, within, a, within a culture or within like a, a polity if you're talking about political science. But you know, essentially like, uh, so in other words, like you, you wouldn't expect you wouldn't expect a George W. Bush to go say free abortions for everybody, right? Like that's not going to happen. Um, that's outside of the Overton window of, of his of his base. Uh, so you know you wouldn't expect me to say yay no JS. Like that's outside of my Overton window. Like I'm not going to do that. Um, so there's this spectrum of of acceptable choices that you can make as as a leader or as a uh, manager or whatever. Um, that if you make a choice outside of that, you basically you you risk alienating. Uh, your your support. Um, so you know, the, and that, that's how you form path. That's how path dependence and cultures form uh, is through your Overton window. Because because as you move along, uh, the choices you can make get narrower and narrower. And so we, we built. Uh, so what was the team that we built? We built a team of systems engineers. Uh, was the, the 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 original team that we built. And um, you know, the, the systems engineering culture is very different. Product engineering. Uh, so product engineering culture favors uh, shipping fast. Basically, shipping things that are probably going to break. You know, you don't worry about the operational cost of things. Systems engineers very much worry about the operational cost of things, uh, because the really the um, what we were trying to optimize for was we were trying to optimize for. You know, we have this system; it's, it needs to process a lot of data. It's a very hard problem to solve, uh, but we think we can we, we think we can do very well with it. But we need to have this this systems engineering culture, and we we really got this the the idea that got instilled in us is that our scale breaks everything. Uh, so we have to we have to solve all the hard problems. Um, there's another another concept as uh, see. So I don't know if there's any Finns in the room. So this is a this is a, a word from Finnish. Uh, Sisu, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation, uh, but it's the idea of um, grim determination in the face of complete failure. Uh, so you know that 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 was like if you could sum up the the, the culture of the first team that like that's what it was like. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. And, and so we, we became, it was really interesting, we became deeply suspicious of all open source software because we'd seen so much of it fail, right? And so anytime a new NoSQL database came out, we're like, oh God, more of this crap. Uh, you know, and, and uh, the problem is, is that as soon as you get, up, as soon as you get suspicious about everything that, that is, is going on out in the world, um, you know, you, you get this, like, it sort of comes a default choice that, oh, we gotta bring this in-house because clearly the open source stuff is gonna be crap, it's gonna fall right over. So we built a lot of stuff in house. Uh, we built our own query engine. We built distributed load balancing. There's a lot of plumbing. Uh, the problem, I mean, the problem though that we ran into is that you know when you build these things in house, you don't necessarily build them to be flexible to be, uh, you know, to, to, for like multi-purpose. You build it for one thing, and it does that really well. Uh, the problem though, I mean, that might be fine, right, as long as everything's going well. But we had a lot of commercial pressure as well. So, um, you know, there was a lot of pressure to, to get new customers, close deals. Uh, do custom work, right, for, for individual customers, because as soon as you're talking about, you know, uh, selling a big enterprise deal, they, they, everybody wants something uh, different that, that, that built on top of it, right? So shipping, and then, and then we, we really got into the, the, the mode where, you know, shipping features was gated on core infrastructure work because of the inflexibility of the system that we built below. Uh, and then scaling, scaling it for bigger and bigger customers as well. So like we, had to, we were having to do all these things, um, and it's just like, it just became a real struggle uh, to keep up. And this is what they talk about, like, when you get down to the hole of technical debt and you can't get out, right? So over the past, uh, maybe a bit more than six months, but um, essentially we, we wound up in this position where it's like, we have this real lack of engineering bandwidth, that we can't tackle everything, so how do we get ourselves out of this technical debt hole? How do we, uh, you know, how, how, do we, how do we get back to being uh, an organization that, that can ship a lot of product and, and get it into customers' hands quickly? Uh, so we're, again, another inflection point to reevaluate things. Um, you know, there's one of the things that we that we thought about was like, you know, can, you know, is there something out there we can we can take off the shelf? Is there, is there open source that we can use? Is there, um, you know, what, what can we do here? The one thing we knew we couldn't do is that there's no, there, I, I don't think there's any such thing as a successful rewrite. You don't rewrite an entire system that conforms to the not just the requirements of today, but the requirements that are going to come in while you're writing it. Um, this never works, right? I've never seen this work properly. So, you know, if you're trying to rewrite the system, you should prefer the mutation of working software over a full re-implementation. Of course, you know, if you do this wrong, you can end up with more technical debt, and um, yeah. So, we came to this point where it's like, okay, well, let's ship something different. 
Um, and uh, really, when we reevaluated, we said, look, you know, do we want to be doing big enterprise deals? Do we want to be selling to people who want custom everything? Uh, so we really came down to, like, you know, we might need a different business model for this new thing that we ship. And if we do that, then we can actually ship something completely different, not based on the same platform. Um, we can use pro like what I would call prototype grade technologies. Not, not everything has to be absolutely bulletproof as long as we can get it out there and prove that it's going to be useful to people, right? Um, you can have a much smaller set of requirements and then focus on user experience and focus on more of that fit and polish type of stuff as opposed to, um, focus on the fit and polish as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, trying to, trying to build the most scalable backend and, and focus on the plumbing. So, you know, what, uh, one of the one of the things that, that we realized was that you know the prototype quality code asking a systems engineering group uh, essentially to, to build a prototype like prototype level code they, they just it's out of, again it's out of the Overton window they're not going to uh, you know, say use Redis what get out of here um, so that, that you know so, so it's like how do you shift culture um, and you know the way that we did it was bringing in new people right so we. Um, we went out and found another monitoring company, a small monitoring company, a couple of people that were doing um, one second monitoring, brought them in, and you know, uh, they've, been, uh, they've been leading the charge since then. Because you know, culture really is inertia, and uh, you know, software is made out of people, right? And so you know, if, the, if the culture builds the product, uh, you, you, know, you, you can't help but the, the, these things are reflections of each other, right? And so the systems engineers are going to build uh, a big distributed scalable system, whereas the product guys are going to build a product. And um, you know, I guess, I guess, I guess one of the one of the interesting things that that uh, I've, I've heard from a number of people um, is that you know th this it's uh, it's just software, man. It shouldn't be this hard, right? Like uh, you know, when you look at what you got to produce, it's like okay, you know, some graphs. You know, it's it's, it's a chart with some graphs. It's uh, you know, just some alerts, right? This is all just software, but the, I mean the. Really, what it comes down to is software is made out of people. It's made out of organizations, and all of the trouble that comes with, uh, you know, having an organization full of people. Like that's what actually what you need to deal with, and that's actually what causes all of the friction, which of what you think should just be some simple software. Um, I don't know. It's a projection of of of, uh, of the organization. So this has become my personal mantra. Um, you know, let's make different mistakes next time. Uh, so I, I tend to I tend to learn I tend to learn uh, through. Um, being arrogant and having hubris and then getting smacked down by the universe and getting back up again and saying, well, I'm going to do something different next time. And uh, yeah, so anyways, that's me. Yeah, uh, terrible, <laughs> painful. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah. Culture, culture is inertia, and, and people are not going. People are going to resist that change. Um, and you know, it's it's uh, people. Pe so people get very emotionally involved in, in their companies, right? Like, uh, you know, you bring someone in early, and like they have a real sense of ownership over it, and it's like, um, you know, they, they they get real defensive. It's just like. Yeah, you know, who are these people? Why are they here? Like, I don't like this guy, right? Like, like literally, it could be a, a reaction of like, I don't like this guy, and you don't even have a rational reason for it. Um, you know, it's it's uh, yeah. So, it, 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 like like bringing in bringing in new leadership is is uh, can be gut wrenching, right? And uh, the, the you know you look at like you look at startups that fail or, or startups that. Uh, fizzle out for some reason, and inevitably, like I wish people did postmortems of like of like failed startups, or they did it more often. I know a few people do, but um, they might not even be all that honest. But you know, it's like I think these, I think the you know teams and and and, uh, and organizations they fail just like distributed systems. It's like they you have these complex you set up these complex web interdependencies and you fuck it all up and it all crashes down to the ground. 
and you need to like look through and say, okay, where did we actually go wrong? Like, how do we avoid doing this in the future? Um, I think people do that in private, but they, they don't actually publish their results out to the world. Uh, so again, we're still working in like folklore land when it comes to building teams and stuff like that, or at least you know small teams that build product. So yeah, I don't know. It, uh, to, it was a rambling answer, but uh, to answer your question, that sucked. Well, I'm curious about the, uh, um, you know, obviously you went through the, I wouldn't call this really not meta here, but the, you know, hey, we need to build sort of everything ourselves. Yeah, I mean, no, you can definitely call it not invented here. I mean, we, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was a certain flavor of that, but, you know, the same result, right? So, in other words, you know, how do you, you know, you mentioned, okay, you know, hey, there's a reevaluation period and so on. Like, how do you get people, if you're sort of addicted to, we need to use the best tech all the time, and if it's not perfect and we can't use it, we're going to build our build it ourselves. And it turns out that that doesn't necessarily scale all that well for a small team. And so, like, how do you how do you begin to shift that conversation and say, look, you know, this does fall over, this does have these issues, but you know what? It does eighty percent of what we need, and we don't have to build it. Yeah. So you, what I yeah yeah so that's that's a great question. Uh, so so what I what I found is is that um, uh, a lot so. Is it, so it turned out it was actually kind of a small thing, uh, but it made all the world of difference in trying to have that conversation um, with the, the, the team of backend engineers. And, and basically what, what it was is that um, if you looked at the amount of time that, the, so they, they were looking at it from the perspective of, they don't actually like really care about what, what, it, what we use necessarily. They care about how much time they're gonna have to spend in the future maintaining it. Yeah. And they, they worry about getting called the task yeah. over the fact that something is down Something is wrong. Customers are complaining, and so what it what it takes there is to say, oh, okay, ah, that's what you're concerned about, and then you remove those negative yeah, factors, yeah, yeah. right? The negative factor of you're going to be called to task over this. Say, yeah, you know what? If it goes down, yeah, that sucks, and we got to get back back up. You, you know, you're not going to be. Uh, no one's going to yell at you for this. No one's going to be angry at you over this. Um, yeah, you, you you take that out of the loop. Um, you say like, look, we'll. You know, shit umbrella over top of you. You know, we, we won't let you get hit. Um, and uh, and the the other part of it is that yeah, I mean, you you, you know, we'll we'll, we'll over provision, we'll over provision these systems such that you won't have to, uh, so you won't have to burn your life away on, on keeping something running that's really sort of filled with brim. Uh, so I mean, those are the two things. Like like people don't want to have to wake up and like you know, like they don't want to have to bring out the laptop during their kid's birthday party. To uh, you know, to, to fix some bullshit in production, right? Like they don't really do that, and they don't want to be yelled at while they're trying to fix the bullshit in production at their kid's birthday party. Like that's like the worst of the worst, right? You're, you're trying to do the right thing, and someone's screaming at you. So, so removing uh, any connotation of like there being any kind of negative uh, aspect of that, like that helped tremendously. But it's still, it's you know, it's like steering a, a container ship kind of thing uh, in terms of uh, what people are comfortable with. Okay. It's blameless downtimes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Which I mean, if you're selling the big enterprises, that's so. So I mean, that's why that's why a different business model is, is required because you need to have a freemium business model for that. Because if you're selling to gigantic enterprises, like they're not going to stand for it, right? Like, you know, like I paid you blah blah blah. Why is it? you know? So it's different expectations. Okay. We're good. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. What's up? I just want to say thanks for the transparency. I think uh, in the technology industry, every company has a work walk and over moment, multiple moments. We've had ours over the last two years. Oh, yeah. And nobody talks about them. Yeah, yeah, nobody talks about them. I mean, sometimes you're legally prohibited from talking about yeah. them because you sign <laughs> contracts. Um, None of this was in any contract that I checked, uh, so that's good. Yeah, no, it's uh, yeah. I think I think people should be more transparent because whenever you hear the stories, everyone's always crushing it, and like rah rah rah, go team. It's like, man, fuck you. You were crying like a week ago. I saw you crying into your beard. Like, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> <laughs>